Ampetu washte midafiepi, wachiampi wi imachiapi. Good day, friends and relatives. My Lakota name is They Depend on Her. I am a tribal educator and activist. I'm also a mother and a grandmother, and I always like to mention that because being a grandmother in my culture means that I have more authority to speak the way that I want to speak. Uh, it means also, though, that I'm even more inspired to do the work that I'm doing. So um, it's, it's a nice thing the first time that a child calls you a grandmother because you think, oh, wow, I even have more status. Uh, yeah, <laughs> grandma's rock. I want to say, Wopila, um, thank you to the Encore team for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And I want to give a shout out to the uh, Indy Encore, the Indian Native Caucus uh, of Encore. I'm very honored to be here with you. Right on, huh? We have very important work that we do in overcoming racism and promoting social justice in higher education and throughout our educational systems. And our work, I know, is very important and very challenging, but I believe that it is work that saves lives, and there is no greater work that we do than that. I believe really strongly that the Creator sets us on a path that we take in our lives, and our work as human beings is to recognize that path. I often tell people you should have the, the courage and the wisdom to recognize the path that the Creator puts in front of you and to take that path. And I believe that my journey in Indian education began before I was even born on the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota. It began with the education experience of all those people who came before me. I was born to parents who had attended boarding schools. My father, who was a first language Lakota speaker, went to a residential boarding school from the time he was 10 until he was 18. My mother attended a Catholic mission school for her entire schooling. I was lucky because my father came from a family that was deeply engaged in public service and he was very entrepreneurial. My mother, she came from a large family and even to this day I appreciate that child rearing, the socialization of children was her greatest strength. I was also lucky in that my dad went to college before World War II at a time when practically no American Indian people went to college. The war and later having children interfered with him completing his college degree, but it definitely did not interfere with his desire for all of his children to be well educated. So by the time I entered, and I'm the um, fifth of six children, um, four of us still living, um, by the time I got into elementary school, we were pretty entrenched in the public education system on our reservation. I'm really honored that members of my family were among the first to graduate from what was then Sente Gleska College, is now Sente Gleska University, the very first tribal college to offer bachelor's degrees. My sisters became teachers. Not surprisingly, my brothers didn't complete college, a phenomena among native males that we still see today. But now, several members of my extended family are tribal college graduates. I went to three colleges before I finally settled in and graduated from the University of South Dakota. By the time I got to the University of South Dakota, I was pregnant with my first child, and that was a huge motivator for me to complete my education. I went into the College of Business at the university at a time when practically no women went into business. There, I had classes where there were two of us two women in the class, and the rest were all mostly young fraternity males. So that was a particular, particularly different and interesting challenge. And I was the only American Indian in my class at the business school, although there were many natives, of course, attending the university. I was really privileged to complete my graduate work as part of a cohort of education administrators that was funded in an initiative by the Bush Foundation. So I was um, able to get my education and, and stay home and work at the same time. I share that story because I often tell Native students, I am you. I grew up and lived on the reservation up until 12 years ago. I still have my home in Rosebud, but I moved out to the Lummi Reservation to work um, at their tribal college, Northwest Indian College, 
Now I'm living in Denver and I'm gaining my very first real urban experience. When I was in school, I didn't have any real cultural education from the school. When I was in college, the only cultural connection that I had was the Native Student Association. My only objective in college was to get done so I could go home. Even to this day, I consider my family and my community to be the place of my deepest connection. I have spent the last 33 years, ever since I graduated from college, and I worked in between when I was um, trying to figure out how to be in college uh, for my tribe, but after I graduated from college, I went to work in uh, the tribally controlled education movement, and I have been there ever since. I have been a faculty member, so I know what it's like to teach. I have been a school administrator in a tribal school system, so I know what it's like to lead an institution that educates um, our children. I have served as a tribal college president, and now I have the privilege of serving as the president and CEO of the American Indian College Fund. Um, you can learn all about the American Indian College Fund by looking us up. Um, we're the largest provider of scholarships for uh, Native students uh, at tribal colleges, Native students in general, and uh, we serve this nation's tribal colleges and universities. So I always tell students, and I'm telling you here, an education made this possible for me. An education was what brought me out of the circumstances um, that I grew up in and brought me into a position of leadership. And my advice about, uh, that I always tell students, uh, no matter what age you are, get an education and the best way to get an education is to be sure and go to class and do the work that they assign you. But you can go to college and I'm evidence that you can be anything you want. I wanna also share my story with you because it is the story of the American Indian and Alaska Native students that go to your institutions. It is a story of perseverance and second chances. It's a story of trying to fit in and trying to find my place in the educational environments where I was either invisible as a Native person or I was the Indian expert. I often had classes where if somebody said something about Indians, literally people would turn around and look at me <laughs> to see if I had something to say. So of course I spoke for all Indians. Um, I, I, I was young, so I had a remarkable amount of knowledge about other Indians. <laughs> but I, I was thinking about this opportunity here, and I realized there is no better time for us to be speaking about institutionalized racism in higher education, to focus on the racism that is experienced by indigenous peoples in North America and among our sister tribal peoples in Central and South America. Racism is a complex generational experience. We could speak about it for days or weeks or years. So I decided that I better get a focus and I'm gonna focus on four points. I believe these four considerations have power and if you fully explore them, it can change thinking and change thinking can change behaviors. I wanted to give my talk a theme, so I looked up, uh, into my teachings and my knowledge about being a tribal person, and I picked the Lakota concept of wa'ableza. Wa'ableza is like an insight or an understanding that you get. We have thousands of years of knowledge and 500 years of contact that we have to summarize in order to reach understanding. So I thought, well, what is it that we could take away today? to have at least a foundational knowledge of the indigenous experience with education. So I'm gonna talk about four points, and of course this is the academic in me. I'll give you four points, you have four things to remember. And it's very sacred to me because Lakotas, we really like four. One is that we must all recognize that there was plenty of pre-contact indigenous knowledge and education that already existed when Europeans came here. Yeah. The other is that the settler mentality that informs higher education today must be understood by us. The third is that there is a great value and necessity to have place-based, culturally responsive education 
And the fourth is, we all have the opportunity to change our behaviors. Although my views, of course, are my own, I believe that they are well-rooted in our shared indigenous experience as Native people. And they are well-rooted, really, in our shared experience as people of color. First of all, I want to say that tribal people always had an education. The very socialization of our children, which is the most important thing that we do, is based in our values, beliefs, practices, and rituals, and in our way of viewing the world. So I never forget that when Europeans first encountered the indigenous peoples of the Americas, they came from an economic and social experience that told them their way of knowing the world was superior to all others. They had the physical power and the geographic reach to prove that, and they had their God to justify it. So in their time, the education of people was limited to the very elite. And while they had that superior economic and military power, for the most part, they did not possess the intellectual knowledge and experience that allowed them to see the deep and profound knowledge held by the people they encountered. They, they could not see it. But our people knew everything they needed to know about how to live in the world. They did not live perfectly, but they lived well. We had deep knowledge of our place. Our knowledge grew based on our experiences and our interactions with the physical and spiritual world. I do not intend ever to romanticize the experience of indigenous peoples then or even now, but I believe that our ancestors had superior knowledge of how to live upon the lands of their creation. Importantly to us, as you look at what can be done to support indigenous people is to recognize that that knowledge still exists and it is still used by our people in various ways to ensure our continued survival as human beings and as people with unique identities. One of the great things about indigenous peoples is that we are extremely adaptive as evidenced by the fact that several of us are here today. I have to give an example of that as it applies to higher education because in my career I've had the opportunity to really explore what does it mean to conduct research in indigenous communities. So I li uh, we have captured the purpose of research for ourselves and many of you are involved with research and so some of this might resonate with you. We want to use research to address our issues and to strengthen our identities. And I want to share um, some of the knowledge of Marlene Brandt Castellano, who's a Mohawk Indian from Canada. She describes the, in, the way that indigenous knowledge uh, comes to us as tribal peoples. First, from traditional knowledge that is handed down through generations, describes our history and experience, and is intended to reinforce our knowledge and beliefs. Second is empirical knowledge, because we know that you gain knowledge by observation. That was not a new thing brought over to us when Europeans came here. We already knew that. Watch and you will learn. And the third and perhaps most distinctive way that we gain knowledge because it gives identity to um, our uniqueness is that we get revealed knowledge from ceremonial and spiritual practice. I want to share that because it is uniquely different from the view of the purpose of research and the gaining of knowledge in our institutions today. That belief system does not reinforce the scientific approach to understanding ourselves. It reinforces the human approach, the spiritual approach to understanding ourselves. So even within that context, it is very important for us to recognize the distinctive indigenous experience. The second point that I wanted to make is we must never forget that American Indian education and American higher education is deeply rooted in the settler mentality. I only discovered those words actually, settler mentality, a few years ago. So it's a term that's very commonly used by Aboriginal scholars from like um, Australia and New Zealand and by Canadian scholars. So periodically, I have really given a lot of thought and looked at what others in the indigenous community are saying about what settler uh, mentality is, and I decided I really like those words. The reason that I like them is because 
um, I can give meaning to those words and I can think about changed behaviors when I think about those words. A settler describes others who come onto the homelands of people and they feel entitled to live there. They generally have a good reason for being there, often economic with the intention to exploit land. Sometimes, you know, they were fleeing religious persecution or, you know, fleeing not being able to have any economic resources for themselves. Um, they, ha they always look to, though, having a deeper justification. And for American Indians, there are many justifications, but a very important one is the doctrine of discovery. Basically, the doctrine of discovery, which is pretty complex, but has a really basic premise, is that we found you, therefore we can displace you, and now we own your land. We have a superior culture, and you should adopt it. We will give you a chance to become us, and if you can't, then you should die. It is a very powerful way that they know the world. I like the use also in the term settler mentality, I like the use of the word mentality because if we think something, we can change our thinking. It is biologically possible for us to change our thinking and with the right support, I believe that each of us can find the place where our humanity exists, that very sacred place where we are all interconnected and in relationship with each other and can therefore overcome the settler mentality that influences so much of our world. Getting back to my point, though, about the roots of American higher education, I really want to give credit to um, Craig Stephen Wilder's book, Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of American, America's University. If you haven't read that book, you should read it. It was such a good book that I even read the footnotes because I thought, wow, where did he get this information from? Basically, what he says is that the founders of the higher education system in this country created the first universities and colleges for the primary purpose of educating the merchant class and the elite classes in the colonies. They funded these institutions, many of which exist today. They funded those institutions with money from slave-holding families and with money from those in Europe who sought to support an elite class in, the, in uh, the new country, in the new world. And ironically, many people, particularly in Europe, who really supported the idea that educational systems could civilize the indigenous peoples in the new world. So when I think about the founding of our higher education system, I think no wonder we have such a hard time addressing issues of race and equity. It goes back to the very roots of our, of our countries. Another point that I wanna make about that is that settlers, then and now, continuing to this day, they arrive at places where people already live in richness and they rewrite your history as a people. They appropriate your knowledge and they twist it to serve their purposes. The story of who we are as indigenous people has been deeply subjugated to the perceived superior knowledge of the colonizer and it has caused us to change our narration. And this narrative change is what has allowed so many of the public displays of racism that still exist today. The Redskins issue, or what my assistant always says, the red acted issue the super drunk display by students and community members at the University of North Dakota. This uh, narrative change has created the blood quantum issue among indigenous peoples where we're struggling to divine our citizenship when in the, among our ancestors, if you were Lakota, you were Lakota. There was no question. That's a, that's a created story created by the colonizers and their experience with us. It has created a very ironic experience where we as native people who held our land in common are buying our land back from each other. It has created a very um, important though response 
and that is the response of developing American Indian and Alaska Native, Indigenous and Native Studies programs within higher education. So my third point is that in order to overthrow an oppressive educational system, we must develop place-based, culturally responsive education. In the case of higher education, this takes the form of tribal colleges and universities and of tribally designed and implemented tribal studies programs at mainstream and private institutions. In the late 1960s, there was an era of self-determination among American Indians, combined with a civil rights movement in this country and a rising commitment to educational ac access that created the community college systems. That sort of contributed to an already existing um, desire in tribal communities to create tribally controlled institutions. So, so we've been around since 1968 as tribal colleges and universities. Um, currently, there are 37 institutions that are members of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. There are other tribal colleges that are not members. Uh, we educate the uh, greatest number of American Indians of any system. We educate about 20,000 students. Um, we also are very community-based institutions, so we reach literally uh, hundreds of thousands of more people in our tribal communities. There are probably another 160 to 180,000 students at your institutions. Uh, tribal colleges have a tremendous advantage because we are able to create and deliver place-based education in, a, in the context of the geography and the cultural population of a reservation. So we have a, a tremendous advantage that is important when I talk about your support of, of tr um, tribal education. We have no doubt, we didn't have it then and we don't have it now, that Native people face tremendous barriers to accessing education. And the establishment of tribal colleges created a transformative experience for higher education in this country. The vast majority of people who go to tribal colleges would never go to college if it were not for a tribal college. It is broadly recognized um, in education that, and among our people, that the vision that our tribal leaders and elders and others had for education was to create an education system that was responsive to the new experiences of Indian people so we could manage our own resources, we could teach our children ourselves, we could run our own institutions. You will see very close ties between um, Indian activists and the tribal colleges um, because we emerged kind of out of that same intention of taking control of the experience of tribal identity and of our rights. So tribal colleges are unique in that they do build their instructional practices and education, their curriculum upon the knowledge of the people. I want to acknowledge that today literally hundreds of American Indian and Alaska Native teachers, healthcare workers, entrepreneurs, scientists, technicians, all kinds of things. Uh, on our reservation came about, reservations came about as the result of the tribal college. For mainstream institutions, this is a much more challenging issue, although I think it is entirely possible to create a contextual, culturally rooted, responsive academic and social environment for in indigenous students at your institutions. It takes work and investment, but with resources, anything is possible. Indigenous studies programs should be focused on teaching Indian students and others, um, not teaching them about, about Indians, but teaching them about justice, teaching them about community organizing, teaching them the history of our people. With support, research and publication can be done in order to contribute to the real dearth of resources that are available to us about our work. So this brings me to my final point. My fourth point is that we have the opportunity to change behaviors. There are many ways for you, all of you, to be advocates for indigenous peoples on your campuses and in your communities. The first thing I wanna say though is that keep in mind that we are not you, just as you are not us. So as people of color, we are all so diverse and we, uh, we have our own aspiration 
or what success looks like. We have our own dream of how we as indigenous people will live successfully and um, with prosperity um, on the earth. So one of the things that you can do if you want to support indigenous students, faculty, and staff is let them speak for themselves. Be there to support them. And I want to say my second point in that advocacy is advocacy is not free. There is a price to be paid by your institutions and in the allocation of institutional resources. Already, we have strained resources in the support of students of color and the support of faculty of color and student support programs. We already have that, we know that. We should be prepared for that because sharing is necessary. We won't have the change in the indigenous experience in higher education if we have to do it by ourselves and if we have to do it with the meager resources that are allocated to us. We won't have the social justice that you are all here to support. The higher education community in the United States has relegated indigenous people to an insignificant, even invisible place. You can help at your institutions by ensuring that they collect data about American Indian and Alaska Native students in their institution. I frequently attend MSI gatherings where there is no discussion about the success of American Indian and Alaska Native students, where institutions get up and they can, presidents can you know, talk off the top of their head about the success that they're having with African American or um, programs aimed at Latino students or even programs aimed at you know, first generation students, but they can't speak. They cannot speak to what's happening with their native students. They can speak more fully to what's happening with their international students than they can to what's happening to indigenous students, the people of their own country. So you can help ensure that by asking, gee, what are we doing with native students? So what if it's five students? We'd like to know what's happening with those five students. Better yet, if it's 400 students. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're all for that. And it's nice. I really want to acknowledge and thank all of you for being good recruiters of Indian students, but that's not enough. That is just flat out not enough. You have to allocate resources that support the cultural, mental, and physical health of those students. You can't just invite them. You have to take care of them when they get there. Unless you are a student going to a tribally controlled institution or a faculty member at a tribally controlled institution or a staff member, you are entering into enemy territory. The higher education in this system is unfamiliar and often deliberately exclusionary once a student gets on their campus. I believe that students come to your institutions with the best of intentions. Something attracted them there. Maybe it was somebody they talked to or something they saw on your website or you gave them a good scholarship. Something invited them there. So it's absolutely necessary that you make that extra effort to support them in their intentions. I think you can also help by educating yourselves. Um, here I want to mention the late Vine Deloria Jr an esteemed native intellectual who um, by the miracle of modern publish has even published after his death. He has a tremendous number of um, really iconic books about American Indians and their experience in the United States. I think you could read anything of his and it will introduce you to other parts of indigenous people's experience and it will allow you um, entree and you can explore other areas. You can always, like I said, look up the tribal colleges. You can look at the College Fund website. You can look up Indian education issues. Look at the National Indian Education Association website. Look at the National Congress of American Indians website and learn about tribal nations. I wanna uh, mention two aspects of your understanding that I think are just so important. One is understanding tribal sovereignty and tribal citizenship because that really distinguishes us from other peoples. 
that really, do, that really uh, is part of what makes us unique. And I recognize that, that sovereignty and citizenship are contemporary experiences for us. We didn't use those terms. You know, the Lakotas, they call themselves the Yate, which just means the people. We didn't call ourselves a nation. Um, that wasn't um, necessarily in our vocabulary, but it has emerged a part of our adaptive experience. But I always share with people that understanding tribal sovereignty and tribal citizenship is pretty basic, even though, of course, there are legal complexities associated with this. Um, but in practice, sovereignty and citizenship are very obvious. All tribal peoples, every tribal person in this room has a story of their creation. They have a story of how they came to be. In that creation, However they describe it, the creator gives them certain inherent rights. The right to their language, which is often the most descriptive way of describing, of, of identifying their relationships and their way of knowing the world. It gives them the right to their place of their creation, which we commonly call today our homelands. Even for those tribal peoples who have been displaced, they still have a place of their creation. We have a right to all the social, political, and economic systems that we need, and we have a right to our religious or our spiritual practice. These all came from the creator. That is sovereignty. That is what sovereignty is. It's our right to exist as a people with, with those distinctive characteristics. Our citizenship, our tribal citizenship has evolved to become our identity within that group of people. With citizenship, you know, we bring many responsibilities around kinship and relationship, and I often uh, think of it as individual responsibility within a collective experience. So citizenship isn't that hard to recognize. It's not that hard to acknowledge that tribal peoples might have a unique experience with citizenship because they are part of a group of people. It's about really our kinship with each other. For over 500 years, the indigenous peoples of what is now the Americas have negotiated, struggled, and fought with the educational system imposed by the settlers who came to this land. We tried everything. I like to stress that. We tried everything. We sent our young people to the first schools that the settler built, settlers built. Heck, the settlers came in and they built schools on our reservations among the Mohawks and other tribes. We sent our children to schools, the early schools like Dartmouth and Harvard that were allegedly founded for us. We sent our children to residential and mission schools. We brought day schools and public schools to our reservations. We pay, paid a tremendous price and we finally grasped that for ourselves and created tribally controlled education and we need the support to keep that going. We face issues today that were not on the table when I began in education and I don't wanna date myself, but you know, we were much more closed off, um, I think in those days. But now we're much more multi-tribal. You know, we might be um, a tribal person who's more than one tribe we are much more multiracial. We are increasingly urban as tribal peoples, and that brings many uh, challenges in the education of our young people. And we are more public about issues such as gender identity. These were not areas that you know, we did a lot of talking about in my early education career. So for over 50 years, Experienced tribal leaders and educators have invested in this change in the face of Indian education by creating institutions that are tribally controlled. We continue to face many challenges not of our own making. So that has caused um, us not to have the educational attainment that we wanna have. But we continue to face issues around health and housing and the lack of economic growth in our communities. We are still paying the price for the invasion of the Americas. So you can help us not be invisible. You can join our movement to build tribal control of education. You can help others by making sure that education and social programs are well funded by ensuring that the support for tribal students in your institutions 
really exists, that there are really resources allocated to it. You can help others see that our languages, our land, and our way of living has to be present in order for us to be alive as tribal people. I believe, as I'm sure you do, that social justice for us is social justice for all people of color. It would right hundreds of years of genocide and oppression among the indigenous peoples of this country. It saves the lives of our children and their families. And I want to say that, you know, I'm very hopeful. Some people say it's because I'm a Sagittarian, and Sagittarians are optimistic. <laughs> but I think it's because I can look out at you, and I can, I can see you. I can see that you're committed to the work that you're doing. And so oftentimes when I speak to Native audiences, especially Native young people, I always tell them, um, you know, we love you. You are our future. Our lives are in your hands. I want to say the same to you. We love you, and our dream for a better future is in your hands. Wopilau. Thank you. <laughs>